Hey everybody, hope everyone's doing well and appreciate you tuning in. I wanted to make a quick care guide video for one of my favorite uh, salamanders out there. It is the tiger salamander, which is the world's largest terrestrial salamander and one of my favorite. I actually keep two variations, uh, the blotch tiger salamander and the bard. But what I wanted to do is give you guys kind of a 2,000 foot overview of the animal and the do's and don'ts of keeping them and um, hopefully provide you with, with some good information because, um, you know, there's some great websites out there like caudata.org um, and places like that. And there's also some good groups on Facebook for this stuff. But there's a lot of good and bad information that people just kind of throw in. And so I've been doing this since the late 80s. I've had tiger salamanders since the late 80s on and off. And I've really learned a lot of, over the years of keeping them um, and, you know, learn from my mistakes and from my successes. So I really wanted to, to make this video to um, pay tribute to them and also to hopefully help people out that have questions about it. So um, I'll start off, as I mentioned, it is the largest land-dwelling salamander in the world. They can get up to 14 inches. Um, they basically are very widely distributed uh, across the United States and Canada and even parts of Mexico. Um, they're noticeably absent from the Appalachian Mountains, the Rocky Mountains, and also New England. Um, and there are several species and subspecies Quick, uh, taxonomical references here so um, the tiger salamander is part of the genus Ambystema which is a mole salamander so mole salamanders are fossorial meaning that they live essentially underground most of the time um, in their adult lives except when they're larvae they're you know living in um, vernal pools where, where the eggs are laid and um, you know until they can mature enough to uh, become terrestrial so um, there's actually four different species of tiger salamanders. Um, there is Ambist Ambystema tigrinum, which is essentially the eastern tiger salamander. There's Ambystema mavordium, um, which is essentially the western tiger salamander. And underneath mavordium, there's actually six subspecies, like including the blotched or Ambystema, Ambystema mavordium melaconosticum. Uh, there's an Arizona one. There's, there's a ton of them on that western... Um, you know, under the mavordium. So um, a true barred tiger salamander is, um, the scientific name is Ambystema mavordium mavordium. So um, a lot of Latin going on here. I don't really like using the Latin scientific names. I mean, there's a reason why Latin's a dead language. So, you know, I I'm going to focus this video on the most commonly kept salamanders because there are some that are unique, like the other species, like the California tiger salamander which is endangered. It's only found in California. It's like black with white spots, really cool animal. I actually had one back uh, in the early 90s when you were allowed to. Um, and then there's also other, you know, there's a Mexican tiger salamander, which is also its own species. But what I want to focus on today are the most commonly kept tiger salamanders um, in the, the hobby today, which are Am Ambystema tingrinum, which is the eastern tiger salamander, and Ambystema mavordium. And then underneath Ambystema mavordium mavordium, which is your typical barred tiger salamander, um, which is like the black and yellow barred tiger salamanders you, you typically see, there's Ambystema mavordium melaconosticum, the spotted or blotched tiger salamander. And those are relatively common too. It's difficult sometimes to tell just by looking at a salamander what it is. I mean, sometimes the pattern and the coloration, you know, you can kind of tell, but you really have to know where they came from. So for instance, I live on the East Coast, the state that I live in, I'm not allowed to have Ambystema tigrinum because it's in danger here. You can find it, I've actually found it in the wild, it's really cool, but I can never own one. So I have to be really, really careful when I go out to find one of these, you know. First of all, there's, to my knowledge, there's not a captive bred program right now in the country for tiger salamanders. There's people that I trust that a lot of folks get their salamanders from who have ponds on their property that act as vernal pools and people have been getting them from these people for many years and so that's kind of where I got mine. Um, I have two different types. I have Mavordium Mavordium which are the barred tiger salamanders. I got them from Texas. Um, I got them when they were like three inches long. They were pretty tiny. They were not larval anymore uh, but they were really really small. I'm going to show you their setup and talk about how I keep them and then I also have two large blotch tiger salamanders. That's Mavordium melaconosticum. And those came from like 
the northwest of the United States. I don't mean like Washington State or Oregon, further east than that, but um, that's where those came from. So I know that they're blotched because of the, the geography and their coloration. Sometimes you have geographies abutting each other, like the eastern, like, you know, so you might have Ambistema tigrinum and also kind of butting up to the same boundaries and geographic distribution of Mavordium mavordium. And sometimes they're, there's hybrids. So it can get really confusing. And to make matters even more complicated, the salamanders actually can develop a color pattern that helps them be camouflaged on the type of substrate that, that's in the vernal pool. So if it's like white sand in a vernal pool, which is pretty much unheard of, it could be a very dull, kind of a whitish gray looking tiger salamander. Or um, you know, if it's a really dark substrate, sometimes they can look, you know, a dark muddy olive color or something like that. So there's a lot of different factors. There's a lot of uh, conjecture and a lot of, um, you know, arguments too about how this occurs. But really the only way to know is to, 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 to kind of be certain outside of doing a genetic test would essentially be to know where the animal came from. Because a lot of times people say, oh, that looks like this or that looks like that. Well, there's really no way to know unless you know geographically where it came from. So the other thing is, you know, where, you know, people always ask me, where do you get your salamanders from? Where do you, well, there's not really an easy answer. You know, I can tell you, I don't get tiger salamanders from the wild. I don't go, you know, fly to Colorado and catch them or where, whatever. Um, I, again, I find, I look on places, I look on rehoming pages on Facebook. Um, you know, there's breeders out there, again, not for tiger salamanders, for other species. Um, but there are people that sell tiger salamanders consistently. If you go onto these groups, you go onto fauna classifieds, you can go on to, um, morph market, you can go on. I mean, there's clearly big kind of uh, commercial retailers that sell them. When I say big commercial retailers, I mean like the, the, you know, kind of like the reptile shipping companies and amphibian, you know, and I don't know how I feel. I've never gotten one from them. I've just kind of heard horror stories. I'm not bashing them because I've never done it, but I try to go, you know, I, I ask around, where'd you get yours from? They look really healthy. And um, again, go to these groups, go to the Facebook group for tiger salamanders, um, you can go to Caudata is one of the best ones, ask there. Um, and that's kind of how you, you find your salamanders um, and how I found my tiger salamanders. So um, I went about, again, I don't have a lot of choice in the kind of salamanders that I could get. So I was able to figure out that it was illegal unless I have a scientific permit to have an Eastern tiger salamander. I'd love to have one, but I, I just can't. And so I would need an, uh, a scientific permit given to me by the state where I live in order to have it. And so, because I'm doing this as a hobby, I'm not really qualified to do that. Um, so, interestingly, though, I was able to figure out that I could have a barred tiger salamander and I could have a um, blotched tiger salamander. So, I asked the people that I knew that were procuring these salamanders, I said, well, you know, where, you know, are you getting these near you geographically? Where are these coming from? And they explained it to me. So, I had enough of the provenance of the animals to know that they are clearly not going to be in any kind of legal issue in the, in the state that I live in. So, um, I got my two blotched tiger salamanders not too long ago, maybe a year ago or something like that. Uh, they're huge. Um, I got two of them and, uh, they were actually water dog. They were kind of starting to morph from being a larva, which is, you know, when they hatch from an egg and they're in the vernal pool, uh, they have gills and they basically eat anything that moves and they get big. And then once they get big enough, they start to morph. Um, and sometimes there's other factors like the water in the vernal pool is going down. And so they, they know they got to have, they have to get out or there's not enough food. So they're kind of forced into morphing into an adult terrestrial salamander. So, um, anyways, I got the two blotched tiger salamanders. Um, they're both kind of like a muddy olive color, like a dark olive black pattern really pretty. They're huge. They're, like I said, they're 10, 11 inches. And, um, they morphed within a month or two. It doesn't take long once they start, you know, as long as they have an area to haul out on out of the water. But anyways, I'll get to that in a little bit about setups and things like that. But, um, and then the other ones were bar tiger salamanders. As, as I mentioned before, they're really small. They had already morphed. They didn't have gills. So that was a little easier, um, to, you know, um, to kind of have my, my setup created for them. But at the same time, they still wanted to be in the water. So I had to create pallidariums essentially for both of, of these types of, of tiger salamanders. 
And um, so with that, you know, let's talk a little bit about um, the set- what kind of setups do I have for my tiger salamanders? As I mentioned, I have paludariums. I had paludarium in the beginning for the blotch tiger salamanders, and I have a, a paludarium for my barred tiger salamanders. When I tell you that I had, in past tense, a paludarium for my blotch tiger salamanders, it was because they still had gills. I didn't want to build them a paludarium, but I had to because when I got them, I noticed that they still had their gills, and I was told they were adult already, but clearly they weren't. So um, I had to modify my setup. So um, what I did was I created a water portion, and I had a land portion. And so essentially all I did was take a piece of acrylic that I cut. It's, this is a 75-gallon um, aquarium, and I you know, gave about 30-40% water with kind of a gradual rise, a little filter, an air stone, some aquatic plants, and then it came up to the land area. The land area consisted of substrate, which I'll tell you about later how I make, um, some plants. I do all my own DIY backgrounds. If you watch my channel, you know that, except for like one or two, which I'll probably update soon. And, um, and that was it, and, that, and that's what I did. It wasn't, I wasn't really in love with that enclosure, but it was functional and it met the requirements needed for that point in time in the animal's life. For the barred tiger salamanders, which had already gone through metamorphosis, they were still really tiny, and the person that I've got them from said, I would definitely give them a water portion, so I did. So I did something similar, um, and they spent a lot of time in the water. They're about six, seven inches now. They've all, you know, more than doubled in size. But um, I'm going to also have to update that one at some point too to be just a terrarium because once my blotch tiger salamanders lost their gills, I redid the whole thing and I have a video on that. Um, and I'll also show you here shortly what it looks like. But So I'm also going to need to do that. My, my two barred tiger salamanders are getting pretty big and I need to give them a bigger, bigger setup. They're actually in a 40 gallon. So I want to also put them in a 75 gallon fully terrestrial and you know kind of the whole nine yards. So um, that's kind of the two setups that I have. And what I want to talk to you now a little bit about is one of the most important things that you can have in your terrarium for your tiger salamanders, which is- the So let's talk substrate. This is probably the most important thing that you're going to have in your tiger salamander terrarium, your setup. It's so important because these animals spend most of their lives underground in the wild, they spend their time in mammal burrows. They dig their own burrows. They a lot of times share the burrows with other tiger salamanders and, and mammals. So it, it's a big port part of it. It's not really sexy. It's not a, you know, it's not like a waterfall and cool stuff to set up in your thing that's aesthetically pleasing. It's really just a box of dirt. But I'm gonna just tell you right now, this is the number one thing for tiger salamanders is substrate. So uh, you wanna have at a minimum four to five inches of substrate. Um, and if possible, more like seven inches because they burrow down. My tiger salamanders, when I can't find them, they're at the bottom. They're, they're all the way at the bottom as far as they can dig, just hanging out. They carve themselves out a little niche and they build little tunnels and that's what they do. Um, especially now they're, they're brumating. They, they, you know, it's cold out. I live on the East Coast, I mentioned. Um, they go underground for months. They come up when they're hungry. I try not to dig them up. Um, I used to freak out because they weren't eating. But honestly, this, it's, this is normal for them. This is what they do. Um, they, they, it's almost like they go into cryostasis and they do that um, until they get hungry and they come back out or it gets warmer, you know? And so I try not to mess with that stuff, to be honest. But what I do with my substrate is I gradually build it from the front. You know, I have two or three inches in the front. You know, you could see it. You know, when I show you my setups, you'll see. And then it goes back to about six or seven inches in towards the middle and the back. And this is um, a way that I do it. It gives a little bit of depth to your enclosure. And, um, you know, well, so what do I use, right? So um, I use uh, cocoa fiber. That's a big part of it. I mix cocoa fiber. I mix um, orchid bark or reptile bark. I use reptile bark a lot because it's just easier to get. Um, I get, uh, some, um, you can use, rep, I, I've been using reptis soil cause it's also easy. You can find organic potting soil. That's the main thing I use is either reptis soil or organic potting soil. Um, it's got a little bit of peat, uh, 
in it and some other things, but uh, it's really, really good. I've been using it for years, um, you know, the or organic potting soil as the main component of the substrate, and then a bunch of sphagnum moss. Um, sometimes I'll put a little sand in it as well, um, but that's about it. Um, there's a lot of people out there, I, I, I you know, like I said, there's good and bad information. So, some people are just kind of like, um, you know, like Wiki, Wikipedia cowboys. They um, they read some stuff and then, you know, they, they're telling you what's right and wrong. I'm telling you, this is work for me. I'm not telling you this is the, you know, the be all end all, right? But that's how I do my substrate. Some people don't think you should put any sand in it. I think that's pretty much garbage because the times that I found tiger salamanders, they're in loamy conditions, which is like clay and sand and other sediment. Um, you know, I've never found a tiger salamander in the wild hiding in coconut fiber. <laughs> so, uh, but again, you know, you know, coconut fiber is a good thing to use as, as a component to your mix. Um, you know, again, the animal's welfare, we're keeping them in captivity. So, um, that's how I do it. I, I, you want to keep it moist. You don't want it to be super wet, which is actually a problem in one of my setups right now, but, um, you don't want it to be really wet. You don't want it to be dry. You just want it to be moist. And so um, this is, again, the most important thing you can do is, you know, make sure you have a good substrate mix. Again, that's how I do mine. It, 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 you know, the, the sphagnum moss helps keep some pockets in there and it keeps it a little bit aerated. Um, and then I put springtails, isopods in there. Um, I, I do grind up a little bit of uh, wood, char wood lump charcoal. Um, just into really tiny pieces and just kind of sprinkle it in there. It doesn't hurt their skin. Don't worry about that. I've, I've never had that issue. Again, I'm, I'm not a vet or anything like that, but um, I do put some of that in as well. But that's my substrate mix. Um, I have a false bottom. You know, I created out of a crate and I put carbon fiber window screen mesh on top of it. I zip tie it together. Um, and and that's my, that's, th that's the main part of the tank. Um, that's why I'm talking about this for now over four minutes, because this is the main part of the tank that, you want to make sure you get right. Um, you know, if 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 the substrate starts to look gross or your your cleaning crew's not doing the job, change it out. You know, just change half of it out, mix it up, change all of it out. Um, but if it's bioactive, then you know you should have um, you know not have to do that really. I mean, that's the whole point of a bioactive enclosure: is the springtails will eat the bacteria and the, and the mold and um, you know, the isopods will eat the, 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 the decaying plant matter and, uh, you know, poop from the animal, <laughs> you know, so, um, that's the biggest part, but let me, let me show you what my setups look like. So here's my 75 gallon setup terrarium for my blotch tigers. Um, I've got two mist kings. I'll show you here in a second on either side going off three times a day. Remember the substrate starts at about two to two and a half inches in the front and goes to about seven inches in the middle in the back. So a little deceiving, but a lot of, uh, substrate for them. Um, using that same mix I talked about. Um, the plants took a little bit of a beating when I moved them in. As you can see, there's some brown spots. Um, they're going to bounce back. Uh, the moss on the walls also took a beating, but uh, created a lot of hides with Malaysian driftwood that's buried and also some cork bark. Um, they're both underground. I'm not going to mess with them to pull them out for this video. I just don't think it's fair to do that to them. Um, but th this is where they live. Really happy with the setup. I think long-term it's going to be really good. It's all bioactive. Got a few isopods, but mainly springtails. And I'll show you the barred one now. Really quick, before I show you the barred the tiger setup, again, this is my 75 gallon. Um, as you can see, I, I think I didn't talk about, um, you know, I told you a little bit about the false bottom, but I also drain it. I have a little, you can see an airline tube that comes from the back. Uh, if you watch my video, you can see, you can actually see a little bit of the false bottom there. Um, I actually think this is getting a little too moist, as you can see. Uh, sorry for the glare from the iPhone. Um, that's what I'm using to film this right now because my camera's battery is charging. But um, anyways, what I wanted to show you is that this is my Miss King setup. Um, it actually does my arboreal salamanders and uh, the tiger setup. Um, so I have everything right under here, um, under the stand, and then I've got the uh, isopods and springtails and various things. So kind of keep everything here. Um, again, really like this setup. I'm gonna try to replicate something similar. may have to replant some of this for the bards, but I just kind of wanted to show you. Have a light, this is a, uh, to be honest, I'm forgetting the name of the light right now, um, but uh, they're pretty cheap. Um, they're LEDs, they're, they have the right spectrum for plant growth. I get them on Amazon. Um, and uh, you know, these are the tweezers I use to feed the salamanders. Um, and uh, I have a, uh, 
a screen lid here. They cannot climb the glass, by the way. They can climb this other stuff, but this is why this is all tight fitting. They can't crawl up the front, but they can definitely crawl up the back. I've, I've unfortunately had one get out years ago and die um, because I thought my, my um, lids were escape proof and they just weren't. So make sure that your lids are tight fitting um, for the areas where the animals can get up because they, they're escape artists. So that's just something I wanted to mention before I move on to the barred setup. And here we go with my barred tiger setup. This is my Mavortium Mavortiums, and they are both out, so you can see them. There's one, <laughs> and there's another one hanging out up here. Animals are awesome, I love these guys. They look like Muppets, amazing. One thing I didn't mention is their diet. Um, I, the, the main thing that I feed them are night crawlers. They love earthworms, they will not eat red wigglers, they don't like the taste of those, but they love night crawlers. I also give them gut-loaded crickets. What does gut-loaded mean? Gut-loaded just means I give the crickets a calcium supplement and I also give them vegetables because um, it'll, it just rounds out the nutrition for the tiger salamanders. And I also give them wax worms on occasions. Really like wax worms, there's some fat in them. It's not a staple, it's just something I give them as a treat. And, um, and yeah, you know, I'm really glad these guys are out so you guys can see them and I didn't have to, you know, because I really wasn't going to dig them up, but I'm glad I got a little bit of action here and you can kind of see them. Really uh, interactive, robust animals. Um, you know, one other thing you want to think about is diseases. There's parasites, fungal diseases, bacteria. Uh, sometimes it's hard to distinguish, so you want to make sure that you know um, of a good herp vet somewhere near you or somewhere where you can get um, some some help if you really need it. I don't really want to conjecture here and uh, pass along information that, you know, I'm not a vet. So I, I've had plenty of issues with, with salamanders over the years, but I really don't feel comfortable uh, kind of giving advice for that. But you want to find a good herp vet. Um, but those are just some of the types of uh, afflictions that can happen to these, uh, to these animals. So anyway, so back to this enclosure really quick. Uh, this was good when they were younger, but now that they're getting older, um, you know, like I said, I want to move them to a 75 gallon fully terrestrial setup. We'll probably reuse this 40 gallon for some spring salamanders. Um, but over here, you can see all of the substrate. Um, it's about eight inches of substrate. You can see the demarcation where the uh, plexiglass is uh, siliconed in. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, this is their setup. It's pretty, you know, it's been pretty good so far. They love it. You know, everything's kind of cycled in here. And, um, but it's just a lot of water. They don't need all this. They, they love the water, but they, they really don't need it. Um, another thing is, is there's, you can see there's some gravel here. I mean, I used it because I have plants in there. Um, there is a risk of impaction risk with that, I guess. Um, although I've absolutely, and this is true, I've never experienced that um, in all my years having these animals, like not once. Um, because I don't feed them on the bottom there where they could, you know, inhale the gravel and it impact their uh, GI tract. But um, a lot of people who keep axolotls and other things like that, um, say so that's a huge risk. And so I, I understand it. it makes total sense. Um, and like I said, this, this setup is just not really, um, I think the right one for them anymore. I'll probably keep them in here for a couple more months uh, until I can kind of figure out um, the new setup for them and, and build that one out. It'll probably look similar to the other one for the uh, blotch tigers. But um, yeah, you know, so um, a couple other things I want to talk about here too. Also, when you pick these animals up, you should always be wearing gloves because remember we can pass things through, sorry, the tank's a little dirty, you can't really see them. We pass things through our skin to their skin and they drink through their skin. Despite the fact that these guys have lungs, they're still drinking water through their skin. It's not like they, you know, are, are like lapping up water like a dog in a bowl. And um, so one thing that, uh, you know, you just need to keep in mind is have a box of gloves on hand when you, when you handle them. Um, you know, you can rinse your hand, I guess, and, you know, kind of mitigate that. But I, I always just try to wear gloves when I touch them. I just, you know, I'm always extra careful. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's, that's just kind of like a um, policy for me um, with, with these animals. But, um, but yeah, I, thought, I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. So I just want to show you uh, as an example, I'll just feed these guys a couple of wax worms, one of them here really fast. Um, I always use the tongs to feed them. And so, um, you know, any kind of movement gets their uh, attention, boom, just like that. You know, they, they eat it um, quickly. So like I said, really easy to feed. They learn relatively quickly uh, where the food comes from and just got to kind of be repetitive with feeding them and they'll just learn to take the food from you. All, all my salamanders have, have learned to do that. Um, so 
anyways, these guys are like hungry, hungry hippos. They'll just keep eating till they burst. So you got to be careful to not overfeed them. You know, overall, these animals are amazing to own. Great uh, salamander if you want to get into amphibians and, you know, you want to get into the hobby. Really basic needs. They're very interactive with their keepers, um, as I said. Um, you don't have to have a super elaborate setup like I have um, or all the misting stuff and all the bells and whistles. Substrate, water dish, maybe a couple plants if you want. They don't even necessarily need it. They need they do like hides, so you want to give them some hides to, to you know, because they're just kind of a secretive animal. But, um, you know, not, not very elaborate. You know, you can totally, some people keep them in plastic tubs. I mean, I don't do that, but some people do and they're perfectly fine. So... Um, you know, it's, it's really up to you and your preference. Um, I will only cohabitate members of the same species or subspecies together. I will not cohabitate the blotched with them. I don't, that's just, I don't, I don't like doing that. I, that's just a preference of mine. I don't know that there's anything wrong with doing that, but I definitely won't do that. Um, another thing to consider is the size. You know, if you have a really big one and a really small one, you don't want any cannibalistic accidents. So always try to keep them around the same size. Um, you know, if one's super big and the other one's really small and scrawny, maybe separate them for a while. But um, that's just something that to keep in mind as well. But overall, really amazing animals. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this video. Um, you know, there's probably some things I didn't even touch on. There's so much to talk about with these animals, but I wanted to talk about the basic stuff. You know, remember there's, you know, several kinds of, you know, tiger salamanders out there that you could probably get, including the barred, the blotched, and the eastern. And so that's why I wanted to talk about these since I own two of the three, but appreciate you guys checking this out and, um, you know, subscribe, like, comment, uh, and, you know, definitely um, appreciate your support and, you know, look forward to making more videos uh, that are helpful for people and talk to you guys soon.